a volcano sneezes in Iceland and once again the aviation industry is left quivering. But is there a way that airlines can perhaps can take control of their own destiny? What we're hoping is that aircraft equipped with this instrument will be able to um, tell probably 100 kilometres ahead of the aircraft where ash is. Also this week, we find out what inspired one of the world's best-selling series of guidebooks. Discover how you get a plane out of your living room and... Kick off in Germany and a swan song for the space shuttle programme in Florida. Join me later in the programme on Insider Guide. Hello and welcome to Fast Track, I'm Rajan Datta. Well, with the grim experience of last year still fresh in our memories, the recent eruptions of another volcano in Iceland have left passengers and airlines waiting with bated breath. And yes, there were more cancellations. So how much have we actually learnt from last year? Not as much as we'd like to have done, obviously. And with the threat of more eruptions to come this summer, it seems the airlines are starting to take matters into their own hands. Nature strikes again, but compared to last year, less panic and a more orderly response. Around 900 flights were cancelled in Northern Europe. That's in contrast to the millions of passengers missing tens of thousands of flights amidst pandemonium at airports that marked last year's crisis. Significantly, weather conditions were kinder this time. Well, the weather last year was very different compared to the weather for the volcano this year. Last year we had high pressure and what that means is the weather was settled. Not only did the weather not change very much, we had winds coming from Iceland right across to the UK for days and days and days, dragging in all of the ash. This time round the weather was a little bit more helpful. It wasn't as stable, it wasn't as static. The winds changed from a northwesterly coming from Iceland and then from a westerly coming across the Atlantic, which helped push a lot of the ash cloud into the near continent. Here it comes again. There has been a notable new spirit of assertiveness, even defiance, about the airline's attitude to events. This time, they were allowed to conduct their own safety assessments. The question this year was not just, is there ash, but how much ash? No blanket ban this time, but instead a defined red zone with ash particle concentration of four millilitres or above per cubic metre of atmosphere. But that didn't stop budget airline Ryanair from voicing their irritation with civil aviation authorities. The UK is not following the same guidelines as we follow in the States or in, uh, in Indonesia, for example, where volcanic eruptions are routine. They never close the airspace. They simply establish a no-fly zone in the immediate env environment of the, the volcano, 100, 120 mile no-fly zone, and then you fly around it. And the airlines on landing do inspections, examine for any evidence of volcanic ash, particles or dust, and if it's there, then you take you pre pre preventative measures. But you don't close airspace based on these mythical and non-existent uh, volcanic ash clouds based on duff forecasts by the Met Office. As the molten lava smouldered and erupted from Grimsverton, so too did tempers and blood pressure in Europe's airports. Like Ryanair, the likes of Lufthansa and British Airways took matters into their own hands and sent out a test flight. And airlines weren't pleased with the levels of pan-European coordination, bemoaning in particular the lack of progress in creating an integrated single European sky. A recent study from the University of Copenhagen concluded that actually last year's response was entirely justified on safety grounds. And engineering experts say the response from the authorities this year was appropriate too. In a sense, we're between a rock and a hard place. I mean, there's an element of risk. I think the risk is generally very small. Uh, but if you've got to take the responsibility and an accident happens, well, all sorts of difficulties will be heaped on you. So um, I have sympathy with the decision makers. It's not easy. 
It's not easy, but right now airlines are trying to make it easier. Even better, some believe, is the prospect of a sensor attached to a plane which can detect volcanic ash hundreds of miles away so the aircraft can navigate its way around the plume. But is that realistic? And is it really a panacea? Scientists based at the Norwegian Institute for Air Research have been backed by the airline EasyJet to develop the sensor. They're calling it the Airborne Volcanic Object Identifier and Detector System. Avoid. Get it? What we're hoping is that aircraft equipped with this instrument will be able to um, tell probably 100 kilometres ahead of the aircraft where ash is. So in a situation like we had last year with AF Jetler, the, um, the aircraft would be able to tell where the, the ash is and avoid it by uh, manoeuvring around the ash cloud. Now remember it would be able to see maybe 100 or maybe 200 kilometres ahead of the aircraft, so this would allow 5 to 10 minutes of time for the aircraft to make a manoeuvre. Over the last year, developers have been using satellites to examine the interaction between radiation and clouds. Prototypes of the airborne detector, infrared technology mounted on a pylon on the wing, have been tested. It's effectively a weather radar for ash. All objects in the atmosphere emit heat. And what we do is we have a pair of cameras which are able to detect uh, heat at different wavelengths and by comparing those wavelengths we're able to tell whether we have ash in front of the aircraft or normal meteorological clouds, ice and water clouds. So it's quite a simple technique. They're basically very high speed imaging cameras working in the infrared. It's not the only attempt to arm aircraft against volcanic ash disruption, but EasyJet are very confident it will be effective and are more than happy to share the technology with the rest of the industry. This system, coupled with other devices, such as satellite technology, will allow us, if and when the next eruption takes place, to be able to minimise the impact of any ash concentrations in the atmosphere and ensure that our passengers can get to their destination without any disruption at all. Here it comes again. While the sensor may be a success in actually detecting ash plumes ahead, there are still issues with actually using the information, especially in European airspace. I think the difficulty lies in the density of the traffic on the airlines that this device may operate on. And in the crowded airways in Western Europe, it's going to be very difficult for planes to take individual and arbitrary evasive action of ash clouds They've got to follow strictly defined channels controlled by air traffic control. EasyJet predicts 100 aircraft across Europe will be fitted with a device. If it does succeed, even to a limited degree, it will be gratefully received. Analysis of the Icelandic volcano suggests meteorologists and, yes, airlines and passengers are going to be eyeing the skies nervously over the next few years. The probability of having exposures like we've had in, in the last two years, that is to say, ash plumes over Europe, have increased significantly. And uh, uh, so we buy, ex well, we should expect to see more of this in the, in the near future. And we want to know what you think about this and the way that the aviation industry has dealt with it. Email us at the usual address, fasttracktravel at bbc.co.uk, which is where you wrote to with your comments on our recent programme about female-only holidays. I think it's an excellent idea having hotel rooms for women only. I'd feel safe and secure and wouldn't be anxious about being stalked or harmed. I think it's really important that hotels around the world offer more amenities for women travellers. It's about time that the industry gets wise to the fact that not all people travel on couple and make appropriate options available. I would also suggest female-only areas on planes. But not everyone was so enthusiastic about the idea. The most striking aspect of the piece on women-only holidays was that it was not described as sexist. If this was a men-only tour company with men-only floors in hotels, etc., I feel the spin would have been different. While Jamie in Abu Dhabi wasn't surprised to see our report last week on the dangers that flying can have on your health. 
I worked for an airline travelling non-stop and went from 11 stone to 18 stone in 18 months. I stopped flying and was back down to 12 stone in two years. Flying isn't the direct cause, but tiredness, changes in time zone, comfort eating and stress are all factors. Thanks, Jamie. It is a familiar problem to many frequent flyers. But I wonder, would travel be a less stressful experience if every airport installed a butterfly garden like this one in Changi Airport in Singapore? Maybe bigger seats and less work would also help us all out. And please do keep those emails coming in. We love to hear from you. OK, let's see what else is making news in the world of travel this week. The Dutch government said this week it will start banning tourists from its coffee shops by the end of the year. Under the new rules, cannabis shops will be restricted to local Dutch residents who sign up for a one-year membership. It's estimated that drug tourism brings in around 40% of Amsterdam's 16 million annual visitors. British tourists have been warned to behave themselves when on holiday in Dubai. The Emirate has joined up with the British Foreign and Commonwealth Office to create a list of do's and don'ts for visitors. Included on the list of don'ts are drinking in public, public displays of affection, aggressive behaviour and dancing in the streets. And what would you do if you had a spare nine years and $50,000? Maybe not follow the example of Dan Reeves from Pennsylvania and build a plane in your basement. Unfortunately, the two-seater plane became too big for the basement and had to be taken out. Of course, the only way he could do that was to remove some of his walls as well. There were some times I was thinking, ah, I'll, never, I'll never finish this thing, I'll never dig it out, you know, but you certainly you have those kind of feelings in that. But, but the, the encouragement from my friends and family, you know, that, that's really what pulled me through. I wonder at what point it occurred to him that his plane wouldn't fit through his front door. Right, stay with us, because coming up after the break, we explore Kenya's Masai Mara. And we find out if there's still life in the traditional guidebook. You can see that we've come a long way, if you know brown guides now. So don't go away. <laughs> <laughs> 